If there's one thing everybody knows Intel for, it's its really successful line of x86 processors. What most people are probably less familiar with, however, is the fact that Intel has tried to kill this thing off a surprising number of times. This video is going to be about Intel's first attempt to kill off the line of x86 processors. Yep, it's time to talk about APX. Trying to kill off your only successful product line could maybe seem like not the best business idea in the world. I mean, it'd be like PCB Way saying we're not doing PCBs anymore. We're exclusively going to be a knitting pattern company from here on out. Incidentally, PCB Way are our sponsor for today's video. See how I seamlessly worked that in? Eee, that's reek professional YouTubing, is that? Intel started work on APX in 1976, and in 76, Intel was a very different company. They'd had some success with their 8080 CPU that got integrated into early micros of the time, ones like the Altair and the MSI, but it had not yet had anywhere near the level of success it was going to, because as yet, the IBM PC, yeah, still not a thing. So viewed from this perspective, maybe creating APX is not as dumb as it would, well, look in times to come. APX, normally written as IAPX, with the I being in lowercase, stood for Intel Advanced Performance Architecture, although many would just say APX for short. Now, some of you will have noticed that architecture does not begin with an X. Maybe Intel just thought that X was cool. I, uh, like many things with this architecture, some decisions are going to seem baffling. With this new design, Intel weren't going for any backwards compatibility whatsoever with the 8080. This should be an entirely new architecture. And it would be entirely new, and very slow, and incredibly unsuccessful. It was an architecture designed entirely around the idea of supporting high-level languages. Most chip designs up until this point had targeted assembler as essentially the level that you'd use to talk to the chip. So most designs had concentrated around making life easier for the assembly programmer. But Intel weren't going to have any of that. Oh no, the features of this chip were all going to be around making life easier for the compiler for high-level languages. This would lead to a pretty complex instruction set for the processor. I mean, at this point in time, complex instruction processors, yeah, they were the only thing that were. Risky is still not a thing yet. And for any of you who thought that VAX had the most Cisky of Cisco instruction sets, yeah, you should really check this thing out. The approach Intel took to make life easier for compilers, well, let's just say it's not how we do it now. Intel decided to take high-level language features and implement them directly in hardware. So a compiler would be able to map its high-level abstraction of a particular idea, like say, if then else, and there'd be corresponding hardware to go with it. Intel even went so far as to put object-orientated support directly into the chip with its system objects idea. There were 14 types of these system objects, things like instruction code, domain objects, context, y you get the idea. They even included support for, well, assisting with garbage collection. They didn't fully implement garbage collection in the chip itself, but they implemented part of it to make life, again, easier for the compiler writers. Now, those of you who know how modern compilers work will note that this approach is very much at odds with how things are done now. But to be fair to Intel, Berkeley was still quite some time off developing the idea of risk. And they weren't the only people travelling in this direction. After all, while Intel are developing this, Deck are busy coming up with the VAX architecture, which again, that'd take a similar approach. I mean, it would literally have an if-then statement in there. But Deck didn't go so far as to include this system objects concept. In modern systems, the compiler essentially takes the high-level language and turns it down into very low-level assembly instructions. These instructions are pretty simple these days. And the reason for this is a simple instruction can be implemented in hardware in such a way that it runs well very quickly. And this idea was basically rammed home with the whole risk idea of having a reduced simple instruction set. In fact, proponents of risk in the early days often used APX as an example of why CISC bad and why risk good. Now, one of the reasons Intel was going gung ho on the OO features was that Intel were planning on supporting a development language for this processor. And that language was ADA. Now, if you're under 40, chances are you have never written any code in ADA. As, even though they have kept updating the language, ADA's pretty obscure these days. ADA's named after the mathematician and early mechanical computing pioneer Ada Lovelace. A woman who is incidentally completely fascinating, if not just for the fact that she was the first programmer in the world, doing her work for a machine that wouldn't be built until 100 years after her death. She also had a whole array of absolutely fascinating and interesting personality quirks too, including believing she had a system for horse betting that was absolutely foolproof. It was not. 
Honestly, the more I find out about this woman, the more I'm amazed and, well, interested to find out more. But I have very much digressed. Back, back to the main plot. Aid of the programming language is one of those languages that comes from the Pascal tree of languages. So if you ever get to see any Ada code, you notice a lot of begin and end keywords. And Ada at the time, well, it'd be fair to say it was the new hot thing in computer science, right at that moment. I mean, that, that wouldn't last very long, to be honest. Building your processor with the idea of supporting one particular language, at the time, didn't seem like the dumbest move ever. I mean, it's really not how things are done now, but at the time, yeah, it seemed like a reasonable bet maybe Intel could pull this thing off. I mean, this idea of linked hardware to programming languages, I mean, it wouldn't completely die even after APX, as we'd see Symbolics launch its Lisp machine just a couple of years after APX came to market. Intel also decided to create their own operating system for this chip as well, called iMax432, with the i being in lowercase and again just means Intel. And Mac stood for Multifunction Application Executive. Yeah, clearly they got Max from that and didn't start with Max and work backwards to try and figure out something that would fit into it. No, 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 that, that clearly didn't happen. Unsurprisingly, they wrote this operating system in ADA. This is the first operating system Intel had ever written, and I think probably the last as well. I mean, I don't remember any other Intel authored operating systems. I'd love to be able to show you a demo of this, but I haven't really been able to find, well, any hardware because, yeah, this thing really didn't sell well. And also, no one's written an emulator for this anyway, or at least not one that's still around that I could find. I found references to one, but could I find a copy of it anywhere? No. By late 1981, Intel released to the world the iAPX432. And it was a right lemon. The first major issue was all these high level features that they'd implemented. They needed a heck of a lot of gates, which meant the transistor count for this thing was huge. In fact, so huge, they couldn't fit all of it on one die. In fact, publicity around the time pretty much described this as a processor implemented in three chips. In reality, really, it's two. Two of the chips are each half of what Intel referred to as the general data processor. That really is the core of this, this processor design. The third chip is what's known as the interface processor. Now, to be fair to the press, yeah, you did need one of these for the whole processor system to function, but you could have more than one of them as well. So it's not really part of the core processor, as it were. Being split over multiple chip packages really didn't help the performance of this thing. I mean, it was already a fairly cumbersome design to begin with, but forcing parts of the CPU to talk to other parts of the CPU via the main circuit board, yeah, that really slowed things down even further. For a start, it creates propagation delay. It also introduces noise, and it means you really can't turn up the clock speed of this thing. Now, one thing almost every computer journalist seems to have jumped on at the time of this thing's release is that it was slow. It performed noticeably badly compared to, well, most of its competitors' CPUs. So, for example, there are a fair few articles noting that it's, well, slower than the 68,000. Speaking of the 68,000, I can use that as an example to show you just how overly complicated this chip was. So, the APX, just in those two general data processor chips, had 97,000 transistors. And then when you add in the IP processor, well, that had another 49,000 transistors in it. So if we compare that to the Motorola 68000, which again, we're slower than, yeah, that only had 40,000 transistors total for the whole thing. Now, it might be a little bit unfair to blame all the performance problems on the excessive transistor count and the fact that it was in multiple packages. Yeah, the compiler was rubbish too. Now, this is a pretty big irony for Intel, given how much they based the CPU around supporting the compiler and the whole Ada language, that their implementation of the compiler sucked. I mean, it seemed that in every circumstance, if given a choice between a faster instruction that would do a thing, or a slower instruction that would do a thing, it chose the slower instruction every time. Right, so let's have a look at some of the myriad of flaws in this compiler. I mean, I'm only going to go over a few because... Oh, there's a lot of problems, and I'm going to go through them in a very high level. We'll start with how it made function calls. Every time it made a function call, and you'll know if you've done any programming, that happens a lot, it used the intermodule procedure call. A very, very slow instruction. I mean, it was only meant to call between 
different code modules, not between functions in, for example, the same code module. But did the compiler ever use the instructions for doing stuff within the same module? No, no, it, it didn't. Then look at how it sets up variables. Now this again is an extremely common operation. And it made the call enter environment for this. Enter environment set up a whole bunch of protection and other stuff. And again, was very, very slow and was not intended for setting up every single variable within the program. Oh no. But did the compiler use any of the faster instructions? No, of course it didn't. And then we'll finally mention how it returns values from procedures, because again, that happens quite a lot. Does it return those values by reference, where it just gives back a pointer to the stack of data it's returning? <laughs> no, of course not. It returns everything by value. So a big chunk of memory needs to be allocated to those written on the stack after... Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, it was slow. So, the short version of this is, performance of the whole system sucked. It sucked because of the hardware, it sucked because of the compiler. It was a big pile of suck. Now remember, Intel were aiming this thing as the replacement for their x86 line. Because part way through developing all of this, they'd gone from the 8080 to the 8086, which had gone 16 bit. And in the same year that this thing launched, something really big happened for Intel. IBM launched their PC. Now this was an incredible stroke of luck for Intel. As IBM had decided to base their PC off off-the-shelf parts, they really didn't have a lot of time for this project. In fact, that was the point. If IBM had developed the PC their way, estimates were it would have taken around 10 years for IBM to get something out the door. So IBM created a bit of a skunk works team for the PC and gave them a time frame in which they wanted a PC available and ready to go. That time frame meant that IBM just had to use parts that were already out there. And luckily for Intel, they chose the 8088 as the CPU. Now, mainly they chose this thing because, again, IBM didn't want to write an operating system for this. In fact, originally they were thinking, we'll just use CPM. And in fact, when the machine was first released, you could buy CPM as an option for it. But because negotiations had broken down with digital research who created CPM, they'd also brought in Microsoft and they'd written DOS for it, and DOS was the cheaper of the two options. I have to say, my goodness were Intel lucky. If the PC had not come along when it did, and IAPX was essentially Intel's flagship product, we wouldn't be talking about Intel these days. Intel would just be that obscure company that made a couple of processors in the 1970s for some machine and then died at some point in the 80s when they released some massive turkey onto the market. The IBM PC and its countless clones is effectively what's made Intel the company it is today. It wasn't that Intel were super smart and made the best possible processor and that's what took the market. No, not even slightly. It just happens that IBM chose that CPU. If they'd chosen a different one, yeah, life would have been very, very different for Intel. In fact, it's probably worth noting most of the clone manufacturers, they didn't use Intel's version of the 8088. They used the second sourced NEC chip, the V20, because it was, well, basically a bit faster than the 8088. Somewhere in Intel there must have been the realisation that APX was going to be a bit of a pig. As despite while still in public saying that this thing was going to be the replacement architecture for Intel, they kept working on chips based around the 8086. And in 1982, we got the 286. The 286 is actually a pretty big improvement over the original chip, introducing things like protected mode for the first time, which would allow things like a Unix operating system to work. It could also do about twice as much of each clock tick compared to the 8086, and could address a whole 16 megabytes of memory as opposed to the 1 megabyte of memory of the previous CPU. IBM would later go on to release an updated version of their PC known as the 80 featuring the 286 CPU. And of course all clone vendors would follow very shortly afterwards. With this line of processes being successful, almost everyone could see the writing on the wall for APX, except for of course Intel's marketing department who started to stick the APX moniker on the 286 processor. It would continue with this nonsense as we had the APX 386. Now honestly, to me, this seems like a very odd marketing decision. That you take essentially a line of CPUs that were considered reasonable by most people who were doing pretty well and shove the name APX on top of it. That would be like Ford renaming the Ford Fiesta the Ford Lemon and wondering why it struggles to sell. Even if you're a really big fan of Intel and you'd not previously heard of APX, yeah, I wouldn't feel bad. This is a chapter of Intel's history even Intel kind of wishes you'd forgotten. I was trying to think of something good I could say about this architecture, something it had changed or achieved or... eh, 
Well, the only thing it really set in motion was Intel's occasional habit of trying to kill the x86 line of CPUs. Yes, this isn't the only time of making the shiny new processor that would take over it all. No, Intel tried this again after this, and in fact again after that, and maybe even a third time. Seems actually what Intel wants to do quite a lot of the time is kill the goose that loaded the golden egg. Eh. Actually, I thought of one good thing to say. It was the first CPU to introduce IEEE's new way of doing floating points. Um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's the one positive thing. Wow, that really is a small positive thing. I should also mention other CPUs also brought it in like pretty shortly afterwards as well, and there were mass co-pros to add on the stuff that also, yeah, implemented it. So that was Intel's APX, a failure, yeah. I mean, Intel wouldn't fail this hard again until, well, Itanium came round, and that one was just a huge, massive pile of failure, just huge. So this one, maybe they got off quite lightly. Well, if you got all the way to the end of the video, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. If you remember APX, or in fact don't, why not tell us in the comment section below? Also, it's nice if you enjoyed the video to give it a little thumbs up, because apparently that makes them share it with other people. Speaking of which, also if you're feeling very generous, why not subscribe to the channel? Because that encourages YouTube to tell people that these videos actually exist.